I don't think it's necessary for you to have a good social following to be a good developer advocate. In, in, in startups, people tend to want somebody with a big following because that's free advertising at the end of the day for them. I think the biggest thing that I would look for in somebody in DevRel is not the following count. Like I care less about that. You might get some prima donnas out there thinking that they got, you know, big following counts with their hot shit and they're just going to be DevRel and they're not going to listen to me. And do, well, no, no, dude, that's not what it's about. You need to be curious and you need to genuinely want to help the community and help people, right? Because ultimately you want to use these tools to augment human product. You want to, you want you want these tools to make us better, right? You want them to make us more creative, more productive, more efficient. The AI evaluations are like a minefield because it's hard to really evaluate them. One thing that I've come across recently, I'm hoping gains traction is the lane chain benchmarks kind of framework and library. And this is really good for evaluating agentic behavior. My name is attached to everything I put out. Every article I write has my name on it. So I have incentive to always do a good job no matter what the situation is. Um, I'm never disincentivized from doing a good job. Yeah, and that was the, one of the other things that attracted me to the DevRel role. You've already interviewed almost mm -hmm. by the people observing the quality and the breadth of your work. And, and that just serves as a, hey, when you come in, it's just a conversation at this time. <laughs> you want me to come work for you or not? So it's almost like a, an asset that you're creating every time. I do want to get to a point where I don't need to interview, where it's like, it's like I don't need to go through a gauntlet where people are like, we want you on our team. Here is a job for you. Do you want it? Do you not want it, right? Welcome to episode eight of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today, we have Harpreet Sahota. He's currently a deep learning developer relations manager at Desi AI, host of the Artists of Data Science Podcast, and runs the Deep Learning Daily Community. Check out his newsletter, The Generative Generation, with over 17,000 subscribers. Harpreet, grateful to have you on the show. Mark, thank you so much for having me, man. Appreciate appreciate you inviting me because um, I'm neither an expert nor a leader <laughs> or anything like that. Mm. But I appreciate you appreciate you uh, asking me on. So the, the humbleness is real, and I've I've followed your your story for a while. I've followed a lot of your content for a while, and I think you you put out some of the best content out there. And it, it's cool that you've been able to keep pace in putting out this content over time. So I'd love to grab a lot of those lessons. Let's let's start off with. What problems is Desi AI solving specifically? Because I think you guys are making a big splash in this space right now. We started out in computer vision, so mostly building computer vision models and kind of um, building custom models for, for clients. Uh, and then recently have branched out more into generative AI and, and kind of using our technology for that. So really like the, the core offering that we have, there's two of them. One of them is what we call the auto NAC engine, so neural architecture construction. So it's essentially in proprietary algorithm for neural architecture search. So typically, you know, data scientists, well, maybe not data scientists, but maybe machine learning engineer in the lab building a model, um, deep learning model for deployment. You know, they're trying to optimize, let's say, for primarily accuracy. And, and then they go and they try to deploy the model on some device. It could be an edge device, cloud device, whatever. And they come to realize that, okay, well, while my model footprint in terms of memory is quite large, um, not only is it quite large, it's actually not, performing as well on the device as it did, you know, when I built it in the lab in terms of uh, inference latency and also, you know, the throughput, the amount of predictions it could do, um, you know, in, in, uh, in production. And what we do is we say, okay, great, you got this model um, that you've built for this particular task on this particular data set. Let's use our algorithm now to then get you a model that will maintain whatever service level agreements you have which is, you know, uh, fit on whatever hardware, whatever specific hardware with whatever latency requirements, accuracy requirements, and then build a model that's going to be perfect for your deployment environment. So that's kind of what we do for the AutoNAC engine. And then we have um, a new product that we've really um, been really pushing uh, over the last several months, and this is called Inferi. And this is a runtime engine. Um, right now, uh, it, it's focused mostly on generative AI. Um, and then specifically LLMs, and it's you think of it as like a um, VLLM, but just optimized uh, a lot faster. So a lot of optimized CUDA kernels and and um, other tricks under the hood that can make your uh, models just go burr. Yeah, the inferencing side and the optimization side becomes very interesting, and it, it's cool to see uh, your company writing a ton of kernels and releasing a lot of models that are coming out now. Um, let's talk about Desi, Desi LM 7B that recently took 
top spot on the LLM leaderboard. Can you tell us a bit more about this model and maybe why the team decided to go after a 7 billion parameter model versus something different? Yeah, so it was just recently released in, in December um, and we just eked out over Mistral on the leaderboards. Mm -hmm. um, but what's more interesting about the model is um, I've been running a lot of like experiments, writing a lot of you know, uh, tutorials comparing it head to head on like real world tasks, like on chain of thought reasoning, on agentic behavior, a um, couple other tasks, instruction following, whatever. Um, and it actually is performing a lot better than than Mistral, um, a mm -hmm. lot more better than the leader leaderboards would would um, indicate. Because uh, really, on the leaderboards, we're only beating them on a couple of benchmarks by a big enough margin where our average uh, just ekes out ahead. Um, so I don't think the leaderboards really. Do, do justice but um yeah it, it's a brand new model that we've um released under an apache 2.0 license mm -hmm. um making use of some uh really cool techniques um multi-group query attention you know group query attention um uh, uh and and yeah it, we, we went after the seven billion market because um we want to build small but mighty you know models um mm -hmm. um we, we will be releasing a lot more uh, larger models, more capable models uh, in the coming months. But we initially wanted to focus on small models um, to really be, uh, I think it fits well with the narrative that we have at Desi with this, you know, uh, optimized performance, fast models, fast inference, um, and good performance. Um, so that's kind of like why we went after that market. Yeah, I've been following Desi for a while and it was interesting early on when I think your lot started off in the edge, almost the edge deployment space where you're, yeah. you're trying to get the tiniest models possible, but maximum performance. So it's a good, uh, I love the work that you guys are putting out. Uh, can yeah. you talk about super gradients, Yolonaz and Yolonaz pose? Those three are different mm -hmm. things that the team has put out. Yeah. Yeah. So I talked a little bit about our auto NAC engine and this is how mm -hmm. we build models. Uh, we discovered um, the DCLM 7B using our auto NAC engine. Oh. Um, and then likewise, we used our uh, AutoNAC engine to discover uh, YOLO NAS and YOLO NAS pose. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the NAS stands for, Neural Architecture Search. So both those models we Ooh. discovered using our, our uh, technology. Um, Super Gradients itself is, um, is a PyTorch-based training library. It's essentially an um, abstraction layer above PyTorch that just makes it really easy for you to um, train models and, and experiment and iterate quickly. Um, number of... Uh, cool tricks right out the box um, that you can use. Um, you know, you can. Uh, it, realistically, it's not a ton different than than you know you'll see with like PyTorch Lightning or or mm -hmm. Tim or or Fast AI or anything like that. Um, but it it's the home of Yolanas and Yolanas Pose, and you know it's, it's a you know open source library and it's, it makes it really easy to to iterate and develop um, computer vision models. And it's specifically, so it's super gradient specifically focused on finding computer vision. Yeah. Oh, so, so oh, perfect. On well, well vision. yeah, not, not finding models or anything like that, but just training uh, PyTorch based models. Like focus on okay. computer vision right now. We've got a pretty robust model zoo, mm -hmm. um, over 40 models. And the models that we have in our model oh. zoo, uh, we have trained them in house with the recipes that, um, that we've kind of developed. Um, and those models tend to perform just, you know, a little bit better than, you know, the, the research papers, uh, that those models were born from. Um, so if really you could use super gradients for any PyTorch based, um, you know, model, it doesn't have to be specific to computer vision, but, uh, the models that we have in our models who are all, uh, CV models. How many people are at Desi? You guys are putting out a ton of stuff on, uh, <laughs> it's a small yeah. team, right? Yeah, relatively. I think we have, uh, last count was about 60 to 65 people. So r relatively small, okay. uh, small, but mighty, um, a lot mm -hmm. of smart, smart people there. The super gradients team themselves, I think is about five people. Um, then our NLP Amazing. team that's putting out, you know, our, our language models. That's only like three or four guys. I think five guys at the most. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So it, it, it's very interesting that with a small amount of people, you can actually put out really fantastic applied research. Um, so you recently had published an article on the effect of the decoding strategies. I think you were comparing Desi against Mistral. And yeah. can you talk a bit about that? I, I thought that was an interesting piece that you had put out. Yeah, that was a really, really fun, um, uh, fun piece for me to do because um, 
I, I, I wasn't convinced by benchmarks, right? I see benchmarks and a lot of times they're kind of, to me, abstract and, and meaningless. Like, I guess they make sense to the researchers and the scientists who are developing models, right? It makes sense to them, I guess. But that's really not how I would use a model um, at all, right? Like, I just wouldn't use it in that kind of way. Um, and so I was really, my headspace was there for a while where I was like, okay, well, these benchmarks don't make sense. Like, there has to be something better. Um, and then I was also really thinking about the effects of all these sampling strategies and decoding strategies, because I didn't understand what, how these parameters would affect a model when, mm -hmm. when you're using it. Um, and so it happened to be like the week, like right before Christmas, um, like two things got published and I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> like this is exactly the things I was thinking about. Uh, one of them was the benchmark put up by DeepMind, which was the instruction, uh, instruction following evaluation for large language models. So IF eval. And then another thing was this really cool, um, uh, I'm subscribed to the AI Edge newsletter uh, by Damien Benveniste. He's yeah, really he's cool. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love his stuff. Um, and he put out this uh, just blog talking about decoding strategies. And I thought it was cool. And I was like, all right, well, let me combine these two together. Let me take mm -hmm. IF eval and you know, see how different decoding strategies are going to impact the ability for a language model to follow instructions. Um, and naturally, I was like, all right, let me just put it head to head against Mistral because why not? Competition yeah. is good. So uh, Sophia Yang is a good friend of mine. So Sophia, if you're listening, what's up, man? Let's go ahead and let's do this. She's <laughs> now a uh, head of DevRel at Mistral. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really cool, um, real fun to, to experiment with that. Um, especially at like these smaller models. And I noticed like just been hacking around with smaller models. It's like the smallest tweaks to the prompt, smallest tweaks to even like, you know, jiggling just like a, a, a decoding parameter just a little bit will mm -hmm. <laughs> produce radically different results. Um, and I see that much more in smaller models than I do in, you know, bigger, beefier models. Um, but yeah, so, so I went through that uh, just kind of, kind of out of curiosity and just, just trying to understand how models perform and trying to find something meaningful, uh, a meaningful benchmark. And instruction following eval is great because it doesn't use LLM as a judge to evaluate the outcome of a model. Instead, it's just binary. Like, did this thing, did the model follow the instruction, yes or no? Um, so the evaluation itself is just, uh, you look under the, the, the hood and the source code, the evaluation is all just like regex matching and things oh, like that. So it's okay. the standard, standard um, uh, old school NLP stuff. But, you know, you give it an instruction um, and you just see, did the model follow the instruction, yes or no? And the instruction could be something like, um, I don't remember off the, the top of my head, but let me pull something up. Um, you can, you can edit this in, in post. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it's all good. We yeah. keep everything live and we hear you clicking and it's switching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for example, like, um, they call them, uh, verifiable instructions, right? So, mm -hmm. so an instruction could be, you know, include keyword one and keyword two in your response, right? Yes. Um, and you have a prompt and you send that prompt to the LLM with this instruction. And on the back end, when you evaluate it, like, did, did it include the word yes or no, right? Hmm. Or it might be um, something else, like, you know, you write a paragraph with some prompt, and then the instruction is your response should contain n paragraphs, and you should separate the paragraphs using the markdown divider, star, 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 right? Um, and this is cool. These are like actual verifiable instructions. And I think about how yes. I would use a model. This is how I would use a model to do these things. So yeah, really, really interesting uh, research paper. Um, I had a lot of fun with that, um, writing that blog post. Uh, learned, learned a ton, um, it, but it just took forever to, to, to do the generations. I think I uh, burned through my entire Google Colab allowance <laughs> <laughs> on that blog post. It took something like 14, 15 hours to, to um, to do all the generations for, for both models, yeah, to the generations for for both mm -hmm. models. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, well, if you ever want some free instances of uh, Mistral and stuff like that, we have AI Foundation models on Nvidia, so we're just hosting these models, and you get up to ten thousand in French requests for free. So go nice, um, you know, go burn those credits, basically. Yeah, we're talking to somebody at Nvidia. Uh, I was uh, exchanging messages with somebody on on LinkedIn, and I think our uh, biz dev team is working on getting that getting that out there because you know we're we're pretty good partners with uh, of course Nvidia. Of course, yeah. Yeah. We, we partner with everybody, so it, you yeah. know it's a small world in the end. I think that's where you end up learning. Yeah. Can you talk about 
the different ways that LLMs are evaluated. So there's um, human evaluation. I was, I was doing a bit of research on mm-hmm. what you have posted. Model-based evaluation, quantitative, yeah. quantitative benchmarks. Can you talk about the challenges with some of these? Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely uh, I go into this a bit in the, in the blog um, yes. as well. So, so go, go read that. Um, but there are, yeah, like you mentioned, there's specifically three different types of evaluations that they mentioned in that paper. Um, and I'm going to, you know, kind of read off my blog. If you, if you read it, yeah, listeners right. don't, don't mind. Um, but there's yeah human evaluation, right? And so the, these are traditional kind of evaluations where a human would go in and say, okay, yes, yes or no. How did this do? Of course, this takes a ton of time, right? It's so this time costs money. Um, and then there's also that just in, inherent kind of subjectivity a human would bring to the evaluation, right? And so this kind of adds a layer of unreliability to it. Then there's the model-based evaluation. Um, and so you're using kind of like a more powerful model, LLM as a judge. Um, and that itself is also inherent with, with the, it has inherently has its own problems. Um, because the model might be biased or the model itself might be sensitive to prompts um, or how you structure the prompt. Or, you know, the model might be sensitive to whether it, it might have a tendency to pick the first response always over the second response. So mm-hmm. you've got to find ways to mitigate that. And then obviously, yeah, quantitative, quantitative uh, benchmarks like the stuff that researchers and scientists use. Um, they're scar- scalable and standardized. Uh, but again, I think they missed the forest for the trees, right? Um, because that's not how I would use a language model. Like really, like you think about how you, I'm not giving multiple choice questions to language model. Like I'm telling you to do something or am I having it interacting with it to, to extract some knowledge or help me perform some tasks. Um, so yeah, those kind of have their own limitations and yeah, that's, that's exactly why I loved IF eval because it's like I use language models primarily to get them to follow an instruction and to do something for me. Um, mm-hmm. and how do I measure how well a model is doing that? It's a great benchmark for it. So check that out. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have eval. Correct. I have eval. Yeah, yeah. It's out of uh, Google DeepMind. Um, shout out! Like I was going back and forth uh, emails right before Christmas with um, with the corresponding author on the paper. Uh, his last name is Zo, I think Je- Jeff mm-hmm. Zo or something like that. Sorry if I forgot your name, but uh, thank you so much for helping me helping me uh, work through some of the challenges I had. Appreciate that a lot. Oh, it's beautiful. So you were actually running this thing. You reached out to the author and he helped you. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's quite, it's nice that people in machine learning space are very open to collaborating versus yeah. in some different spaces. Yep. yep. So we've been talking about evaluating LLMs and you made this comment that oftentimes the, the way that an LLM is evaluated in the research domain is different to the actual production domain. Um, so you mentioned how you use language models. But you also run this large community. What, how have you seen other people maybe trying to evaluate LLMs in production use cases? Um, is it, you know, I'm, I'm measuring a couple of prompts. Is it on a specific task like recommender systems? Anything? Any insights there? Yeah, I guess uh, the there's a, a great uh, a slide deck put out by the AI snake oil guys. Like, and I love the title of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, the title of it is uh, AI evaluations are like a minefield. Pretty much, mm. and that's actually what you're saying, and it is because it's hard to really evaluate them. Um, and um, one thing that I've come across recently that I've, uh, I'm hoping gains traction um, is the Langchain benchmarks kind of framework and library. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is really good for evaluating agentic behavior. So they have a set of um, uh, small data sets, really, um, and it's essentially evaluating the ability for a language model to use a tool, right? So for an agent okay. to use a tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's super important, right? So can, you know, IF eval is great. Can it follow instructions? Langchain benchmarks, they have a number of different um, benchmarks. Like there's one that uh, sees how well it does with just using um, a typewriter kind of tool. Uh, one that gives, uh, it's called Multiverse Math. And I wrote a blog post, I published it um, earlier today. Um, and it's um, using the Multiverse Math, comparing Mistral against Desi and um, again, we, we get into that later, but there's some interesting things I uh, saw there. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there's also um, the ability for a language model, an, another benchmark they have to um, interact with structured data. So like, you know, you, you give the language model some uh, d- data essentially, 
and you ask it to perform queries against that data and extract mm -hmm. information and how well will that do? Um, so evaluating language models uh, within the capacity of agenting behavior, that's great. That's something that people are doing. Obviously RAG-based evaluation as well as retrieval augmented generation, like how well is the language model kind of performing um, in that context as well. So Ragas is a good library for that. Um, yeah. Ragas, what does that sound for? Um, Retrieval augmented uh, generation. Yeah, um, assessment. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes, assessment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think the guy's name is, uh, is it Su, Su Hall or Suhas S? Mm -hmm. Su Hall or Suhas. Um, Exploding Gradients is the name of their, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's a startup or, or what it is, but, but the org on, on, on GitHub is called Exploding Gradients. Yeah, that's super interesting. And <clears throat> as I was in Such before, I came to NVIDIA and, you know, evaluating performance across many different domains of search is very interesting. So the way that an e-commerce person would search and how you would measure what's relevant for that person versus someone with a document and, and looking forward to how the context window game plays out. So the context window says, you know, if I have a larger context window, I can send more information to the language model to summarize. But the more information I send, the, the bigger my KV cache and the more memory I need to process these types of requests. So it, it's very interesting to see the evolution of techniques that now try to um, encapsulate information inside your parameters versus running with your prompts, like prompt tuning, prefix tuning, stair LLM, all of those different types of techniques. Um, do you see a lot of people fine tuning 7B, 13B, and 7AB? models typically um yeah so i just uh, before i get there just you, you just what you just said sparked off like an idea for a project i would probably like to undertake is just like taking these models across a weight class let's say 7b that have particular context window and trying to find some way to measure uh how good or bad that model is at retrieving uh, in the middle context i think that would be a really cool project to do that'd be fun to do um but fine for fine tuning um um, you know, there's, there's a great org out there called LLMware, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, blocks and they, they fine tune models specifically for rag. Um, and I think that's an interesting use case, fine tuning model. So that's really good at, at rag. Um, and it, it does amazing. Um, but when you're fine tuning a model, I think you're mostly fine tuning just for behavior, right? Not necessarily to extract knowledge or, or, um, because that, you just use RAG for that, right? If you're just going to use a language model to be in touch with fresh information, you might as well use RAG. Um, mm. But I think a interesting use case might be to fine tune a model, a smaller model um, for agentic behavior. Uh, so another thing on my long list of fun projects to do is, uh, you know, take the link chain benchmarks, um, the, the benchmarks that they have, there's really good instructions and documentation around that, create a synthetic data set, take a smaller language model, fine tune it on that data set and see how well it performs on the link chain benchmark tasks. Um, if anybody's up for helping me do that, that'd be great. Um, we probably have to use GPT-4 or something like that to generate the data set. But um, I think fine tuning for function calling or fine tuning for agentic behavior could be uh, very promising. Um, but yeah, when I see people fine tuning, it's mostly taking a base model and maybe fine tuning it for instruction, instruction, you know, uh, so, so instruction following or fine tuning for chat. Um, okay. but yeah, like I haven't seen a lot of other fine tuning use cases, I guess. Um, maybe I'm just not exposed enough to people, uh, <laughs> to people building, but, um, my general rule of thumb is you want to fine tune for behavior, uh, and then use retrieval augmented generation for, um, uh, you know, giving the model access to fresh knowledge or fresh information. Can you describe? For the audience, this notion of, you know, what is an instruction to some degree versus a prompt in addition to um, looking at, so you've mentioned the coding strategies as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, how do you define, let's say, fine tuning in the context of RAG? So, so I think there's, you can now fine tune the retriever model, or you can, as you're saying, fine tune the actual instruction model. Um, and, and what are some things people should keep in mind when they're doing fine tuning? just based on your experience or what you've seen from other people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I feel like there's a, a, f- a few different questions. There's a few loaded, um, yeah. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> which one should we start off with? I guess. Which, um, which one let's wanna, let's start off. Yeah, yeah let's let's keep keep on the fine tuning thread. Um, mm-hmm. How do you define sort of fine tuning for mm-hmm. in a rag context? And the two different places, I guess, that you can fine tune. Yeah. Um, so fine tuning in, in a rag context. Um, so uh, again, check out the work by by LLM where I'm really like impressed by what they're doing. Um, I've myself have never taken a model based model and fine tune it for the task of retrieval augmented generation. Cool. Um, so, so I can't speak too much to that. I've, and I've, you know, I'm just like a, a hacker at the end of the day. Like I just love playing around with stuff. Right. So I love taking base models and trying to um, tune them for different behaviors and just kind of see what happens. Right. And part of my, my job at Desi is when we have the base model before we release it to the public, I've got a red team in and I've got to use it like the community would. Um, mm. A biggest thing by far, honestly, it, it's going to be cliche as heck and then probably not surprising to anybody, but the data set, right? <laughs> Your data set quality matters. So that's like the biggest consideration, I think, with um, fine tuning a model, right? It's making sure you have a good data set. So if you have a data set um, and you're trying to have the model, you know, follow instructions. Uh, so let me take a back step real quick. We talk about a base model versus an instruction tune model versus like a chat tune model, right? A base language model is essentially just uh, text completion, right? You give it a text and it's just going to complete, you know, what it, based on what it thinks should come next for however many tokens you want it to complete for. So you might give the um, base model like an instruction, like write me a song about birds. And the base model might complete that by saying, write me a song about doves write me a song about swallows write me a song about blue jays right it might complete like that an instruction tune model if you tell it write me a song about birds it will actually write you a song about birds um and the way that you know we've taken this base model which is essentially just text completion model and we fine tune it for this behavior this behavior is to take human input and follow the task and you get it to follow tasks well by having high quality data sets um so open orca um specifically slim orca is what we fine tuned um uh desi lm 7b to create desi lm 7b instruct but then there's also like a chat uh, an instruction tune model is different from a chat tune model because an instruction tune model you can't have like this ongoing dialogue with it um so you need to then take that model and then fine tune it again for this behavior of continued dialogue and continued conversation. And again, that just comes down to having uh, good data sets. Um, but it's one thing to fine tune a model, right? Um, it's another thing to, f- to, to have that model uh, fine tuned in like a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of resources <laughs> with, with, you know, um, with whatever budget you have. Um, so you have to make considerations for the, the, uh, what's called parameter efficient fine tuning. Do you want to do a full fine tuning of the model or do you want to maybe add some adapters, uh, maybe using LoRa or QLoRa um, and, and fine tune just a few of the parameters um, instead of all the parameters. Um, so that's, you know, another consideration. And there's hyperparameters, I guess, associated with that, with, with LoRa and QLoRa. Uh, Sebastian Raska had, had done a number of um, experiments that he published through his newsletter. Um, I think he said he did like hundreds or thousands of whatever uh, experiments with, with parameter efficient fine tuning and reported his, his findings there for the, the hyperparameters. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another kind of consideration is do you want to fine tune for what behavior and um, do you have resources for full fine tuning or do you need to do some parameter efficient fine tuning? Yeah, and I think the, the space of parameter efficient fine tuning is, is becoming wider and wider and as you think about, okay, I've done parameter efficient fine tuning. What does that look like on the inference layer? Which is what I think Desi plays a lot in as well. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. good to, that you call out that distinction, essentially. A lot of people, yeah. there are a lot of people that are leading teams that are now become, I would say, Gen AI executives to a degree. What advice do you have for them as they think about deploying Gen AI? within their workloads, within their business? Anything that you've come across, across the community and folks that you've interacted with? Man, that's a good question. I guess, uh, first of all, it's not like a uh, one size fits all 
pill, right? Just just because there's the hype around Gen AI, I don't think it necessarily means you need to jump on the bandwagon. Hmm. Um, so first, just kind of see where it is that you can use it. Does it fit into your company's workflows? Um, how will it benefit the people that you know you have in your team? Because ultimately, you want to use these tools to augment human productivity. You want to you want you want these tools to make us better, right? You want them to make us more creative, more productive, more uh, more efficient. Um, so, you know, find opportunities where, or rather if you don't have opportunities where you could do that, then it, you know, might not make sense to, to use Gen AI, Gen AI. Um, if you do choose to use it, then, um, how, how do you plan on using it? Like what environment are you in? I, I imagine, uh, someone using Gen AI at like an insurance company or a law for, firm or like a medical company, um, will have much different requirements than somebody using it. Um, in not a non highly regulated environment. Um, but those are concerns as well. And then there's also the concern of, do I go with, you know, the provider like open AI or, or cohere or writer, or, or do I post my own service and, and just use an open model and build infrastructure in house. Right. Um, so these are all kind of concerns as well. And then also just, you know, d data is also paramount, right? Like you need to have, good data is, you know, if you're building a rag based system, if you want to build like a QA, uh, kind of question answer system chatbot for, for people in your company to interact with maybe your own internal documents, well then make sure that stuff is on point. You have to make sure your data quality is, is good. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's always what it comes down to is what I notice is, is data quality on, in a very unsexy manner. <laughs> yeah. Data quality is definitely the most unsexiest thing about machine learning <laughs> yeah 100 percent, man if you're an executive and you're not as technical because oftentimes executives have to make different decisions to an underground technical person a principal scientist senior data scientist senior ml engineer what level of knowledge should an executive have when it comes to driving some of these products to, to completion or to production. Any thoughts there? Definitely kind of just have an understanding of the vocabulary terms. I think that's most important. Just have an understanding of the vocabulary terms. I don't think an executive needs to, you know, necessarily be a hacker and hack around, but um, understanding the, 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 the vocab terms, I think is, is crucial. Um, it's like, I, yeah, I think execs, that would be, the biggest thing um yeah that's really all of them. <laughs> that's really the only tip i have there vocab terms man just, just <laughs> yeah yeah it could get it could get confusing right because you're talking about yeah. instructions versus prompts and then you might hear some folks talk about kv cash and that in excuse me increasing your cost for deployment so i'm, I'm definitely aligned with your your vocabulary tip yeah uh, one of the shift into your career can you give us a highlight journey of your career from college and till till now I've seen you you've taken some interesting <laughs> paths so that's always always good to yeah know. um yeah like you know i'm probably a lot older than most people in the industry like i just turned 40 earlier in 2023 congrats, I'm 41 congrats. in a few months yeah thank you um i'm closer to 41 than 40 now but um yes yeah, it's, it's been a lot of a lot of twists and turns um so I studied economics in, in undergrad and I wasn't a very good student. And, um, you know, my mentality was C's get degrees. Um, <laughs> oh, I like uh, which that. is true. We have a lot in common, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like I, I, I went to school, Cal State Fullerton, just to get as far away from Sacramento as possible, just due to the influences and, 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 and bad things that were in my environment there, um, got to Cal State Fullerton and it turned out that you could take me out of the environment, but you couldn't take the environment out of me. Um, mm. And so I still continued the same behaviors when I got to Cal State Fullerton um, and ended up just not doing very well. Uh, graduated, of course, uh, wasn't a good student and had zero skills upon graduating. Um, and not only that, I graduated in 2007, uh, late 2007, right, right Ooh. before the economy just went to shit, right? Um, and so the, you know, 
state of California thought I was good enough to be a teacher. So I took a couple of exams and became a substitute teacher, essentially, uh, and um, a long-term substitute teacher where I was teaching math to uh, disadvantaged students. So students that were on academic recovery. So these are students that had gotten kicked out of um, school, gotten kicked out of continuation school, fresh out of juvenile hall. Um, and on the other end of it, though, there was also a small cohort of students that were just trying to get uh, through high school as quick as possible to get to college because they're so smart because it's all self-paced learning. Um, so I taught math there for a couple of years, realized that, oh my God, like I, you know, I love math and it's great, hmm. um, but I can't make a lot of money as a teacher. What's the, what's the thing I could do with math? And back then, this is, I'm talking 2008, right? 2008, 2009, um, actuary was the thing. Um, that came up in my Google searches. I was like, all right, great. What do I need to be to become an actuary? Um, and that's kind of what I set my sights on. And there's a long journey for me to even get through grad school and all that, whatever. Um, eventually got through grad school, uh, took some actuarial exams, became an actuary, met my then uh, girlfriend who lived in Winnipeg, uh, was practicing optometry, decided to come to Winnipeg to be with her. And the only job that I could... Um, Secure in Winnipeg was as a biostatistician. Hmm. Um, so same set of skills, because I left grad school studying math and statistics. Um, and I was primarily using the uh, SAS, SAS, uh, programming language to do statistics. So same exact set of skills and tooling that I use as an actuary, I was using as a biostatistician, just a different domain. Worked as a biostatistician for about five years uh, because I was here on a work visa in Canada. I'm from the States, right? I'm from California, Sacramento, California, born and raised. Um, and, uh, worked as a biostatistician for about five years, got my permanent residency, meant I can work anywhere and decided working, decided to work at a local company, uh, e-commerce company as a uh, data scientist. Um, okay. cause it was about 2017, 2018 where, um, I was like, all right, like you know, I wasn't really passionate about, about biostats. It was just something I had to do to get to where I needed to be. And I was where I was needed to be now. So I figured I can go do the things that I wanted to do. I was always interested in predictive modeling and it turned out that predictive modeling had been rebranding, rebranded as machine learning and data science. Um, so I started pursuing that career path, landed a job in Winnipeg, uh, worked there for about a year at Bold Commerce as a senior data scientist. Um, they hired a bunch of us all at once to build a data team out. So I was kind of like the de facto lead uh, of the team. Uh, then worked at another company here locally in Winnipeg called Price Industries, where I was a uh, you know, the lead data scientist helped build a model there, deployed it to production. I think it's still being used there. Um, and, you know, now fast forward to about early 2020, started the podcast, Artists of Data Science, ended up getting a sponsorship from Comet ML. Um, mm -hmm. And they sponsored the podcast to stamp their name on the podcast for several months um, before they uh, invited me to work for them as a developer advocate. And so this is kind of, early 2021 where I started working as a developer advocate for Comet ML. And that was kind of my uh, step into like the tech world and developer advocacy kind of, kind of roles of in an official capacity, at least. Um, and since then it's just been, yeah, DevRel and tech and just working on cool shit. It's been awesome. That's a beautiful story. Did you, did you have inclinations early on that you would be a good DevRel and you just weren't aware? Of the DevRel position, I I I'm, I ask that question selfishly for my for myself. So when I was making, so again, remember that first job I really had was as a teacher, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, and then when I was making that transition from biostatistics into data science, I had joined this kind of program. You know, back then it was the only one of its kind. Uh, a guy was very smart and adept, and noticed that he can create a course to mm -hmm. capitalize on the hype. And this course was called Data Science Dream Job. Uh, I joined as a student and by joining as a student, paying whatever, a thousand something bucks for it, you get access to the Slack community. And in the Slack community, I just started being really helpful. People ask questions. I'd be like, oh, that's a good question. I would like to know the answer to that myself. Let me help you find the answer. Um, and I'd answer people's questions in the Slack community. Eventually the founder took notice and was like, hey, would, uh, would you be interested in joining in an official capacity as a mentor to help me out? Sure. Great. And to be a mentor. Um, meant I was just, you know, it became my job to answer people's questions on, on Slack and, um, also host office hours. Hmm. So once a week I'd 
have a session where people would come in and they'd, you know, ask questions and, and I'd help them. Uh, and so that was kind of like the, you know, it, it became a lot more as, you know, as it became better and better he made me like the principal mentor and I, you know, responsibilities were putting on technical sessions, right? So you think about that, uh, helping out in the community, hosting office hours, creating technical content and, you know, technical workshops. Like this is all DevRel work. And I was doing this since 2018. Um, and that was kind of like, I didn't know there's a word for that. I little, uh, let alone know that this was like a full-time job that people have as a career. Um, and so that's kind of always been in me. Like, you know, my, my, my philosophy is you get better by teaching, you get better by helping other people through it. Um, and, and that kind of stuck with me and I get to do that now as a full-time job. So how do you know if you're good at DevRel? Like DevRel is an umbrella term at the end of the day, much like data science is an umbrella term. Um, within DevRel, you've got roles like community manager. You've got roles like developer advocate, developer experience engineer, uh, evangelist, or, you know, just full on, you know, the manager of the, of the, of a department. Um, but it is an umbrella term. Um, and not only that, the skills are varied. You might have somebody that's really good at, um, creating videos, YouTube videos, right? You might have somebody that's, you know, really good at writing blogs or writing research. Uh, you might have somebody that's really good at like short firm tweets that are, you know, uh, instructive. Um, so there's a wide variety of skills that come into play there. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. I'm, I'm all positive. No, it did. It, it did. Yeah. <laughs> I, the reason why I selfishly asked that question was I wasn't aware of the developer relations role because technically I probably lived on a rock in Florida and <laughs> a warm rock, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and I had a friend who he was a developer advocate at Microsoft that I had went to school. He was a couple of years ahead of me. Shout out Cecil Phillip. He's at Stripe now. And he was a developer advocate for Microsoft. That's when Paige Bailey was at Microsoft at that time. And he had sort of put Paige Bailey on my, on my radar in terms of, hey, you would be a good fit for the team. You can speak to people. You can code. You're doing machine learning, all of that stuff. And I was like, oh, people get to travel around, talk to people, go to conferences and you're not just sitting in a room all day coding. Okay, I, I want to do this. One of the things that stuck out to me when I went for the interview, a, a part of their feedback, you know, I, I didn't get the role, but a part of their feedback was I didn't have enough of a social following. Hmm. And that always stuck out to me from that point in terms of all of the time that you put into, excuse me, um, your personal brand is an investment long-term for the opportunities that can open up for you. So that, that had me thinking a lot about how do I now intentionally start to grow a meaningful following, providing value to an audience and, and learning, you know, going through that entire process. But now um, I think I'm more aligning to the DevRel role, not, not a complete DevRel, so I, I, I DevRel on the side and I, I, I dabble to a degree. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you articulating that just because there are lots of folks who are not a hardcore research scientist, okay, but they're not a hardcore non-technical person. And, and there's this beautiful space in between that I, I think people can play in and, and provide value. Absolutely. And I think I've, I find myself in that perfectly, right? Because I'm not the world's best engineer. Uh, but I can code pretty damn well. And I'm not the strongest research scientist, but I love doing research oriented projects. Um, you know, like it's that happy medium, but a word about that social following thing. I think, I think that is a, um, I don't think it's necessary for you to have a good social following to be a good developer advocate. Um, I think that early on, uh, in, in startups, people tend to want somebody with a big following because that's free advertising at the end of the day for them. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I'm trying to say is just because you have a large social following does not mean that you need to go into DevRel. Like, don't think of it as like, oh, I've got a huge social following, so I should do DevRel because, you know, that's not true. You probably, you know, might not be good at the role of DevRel. You might yeah. be very disillusioned by thinking that, oh, my job is just to write on LinkedIn and write on Twitter or whatever. Like I get paid to do that, but really that's not, right? That's not your job. It's a lot more than that. Um, so yeah, I've also seen that in, um, in some job postings where you need to have like a minimum Twitter following or you know, minimum whatever following. And I'm, to me, that's like a red flag. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to even bother applying for that role. Um, 
but yeah, I don't think you need to have a big social following, but I do think you need to put yourself out there and create content to as building your portfolio, whether it's writing on medium, writing on a newsletter, creating YouTube videos. Like it doesn't matter if you have a big following or not, just put your heart into making really good informative content and, uh, you know, enjoy that. I think the biggest thing that I would look for in somebody in DevRel is not the following count. Like I care less about that. You might get some prima donnas out there thinking that they got, you know, big following counts with their hot shit and they're just going to be DevRel and they're not going to listen to me. And, well, no, no, dude, that's not what it's about. Um, you need to be curious and you need to genuinely want to help the community and help people, right? That's a huge piece of what I try to do with DevRel is we're in this brand new space of LLMs, right? Like I'm not a expert by any means on anything. I'm just really not. Um, and not only that, like Gen AI has only been a term for a year, year and a half, two years, maybe. Um, there's a lot of gaps in content. Um, you should take it upon yourself to find those gaps in content. Um, and those gaps in content, you find that by seeing, okay, what questions do people have? How can I answer that question? You go into, like, I attend a lot of webinars from a lot of different companies. Um, a, because I'm curious, right? That's the biggest thing I look for, for in a DevRel is curiosity. Um, but not just the idle curiosity, curiosity that's followed through by execution and trying to answer and fulfill that curiosity. Um, but I, I know I'm kind of going all over the place here, um, but. No, I'm enjoying it. Keep, yeah. keep going. <laughs> you you want to, you know, I, I go to, to, to these meetings and I look at the questions that pop up in the chat. And I look at the questions that the, the person didn't answer. Okay, well, why didn't they answer that question? Is it because it's a place that, it's a good question, but there's not a lot of stuff done to address that question, not a lot of content out there to address that question. All right, that's an idea for me to then go and fill that gap. Let me see if I can muster enough resources or muster enough um, you know, research to, to answer that question. Um, so yeah, keeping your-, your I'm very happy that you're yeah. opening this thread yeah, because I've admired a lot of people for a long time. And this is over the course of years. For instance, like Paige Bailey, when I first discovered who she was and I tracked her career for, that's almost six years. So mm -hmm. imagine you're watching this person's progress, you're watching their moves, you're watching how they, they move in the marketplace with that curiosity from the perspective of uh, this person is, I, I like to highlight her career just because she's made very interesting outsized moves moved mm -hmm. and that that's always stuck out to me from a learning perspective and understanding why why did she go to this position how did she get this position what does that mean and how she intentionally was building her brand over time and that inspired me um for many years and with that it also made me realize okay i am not a page bailey from the perspective of like with different people we're interested in different things but abstracting away using that curiosity to abstract the best practices of how she navigated her path and now for me to implement it in my own unique way. And, and the reason for bringing this, this particular part of this thread up is that oftentimes I think we'll see the influencers, maybe folks like yourself, where I'll go do exactly what Harpreet is doing, but not necessarily recognizing that Harpreet has done this exploration around how does he communicate with an audience? What, what drives his curiosity? What's his best action of generating content? And I, I've noticed for you, it's the podcast and it's these fairly deep in-depth blogs that I think you, you sit down and think a lot about. In addition, you're collaborating with different people. That's another thing that I've, you know, I, I just learned in this interview. So can you comment on the process of finding your own style? Or I'd like to mm -hmm. say in your words, a vibe check. How do you how do you find your vibe for yeah. um, giving value to an audience? Yeah, I think um, you you definitely can't make it in this world just by aping somebody else's style, right? And just trying to be like somebody else. So um, there's a you know a philosopher, investor, technologist, Naval Ravikant. I guess mm -hmm. uh, he's mm -hmm. you know big big influence of mine. Uh, but something he talked about in this podcast, how to get rich without getting lucky. There's a segment on it that. where it's called the good, good podcast, uh, a cure of the dawn mm -hmm, took that mm -hmm. entire album, made it. Do you, you've heard it. Yeah. Oh dude, I listen uh, to that all the time. That, that's, that that's thing has completely reframed my entire 
Yeah. Mindset. Yeah. I care that Don's dope. I interviewed him on my podcast and it's, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow, He's like wow, follow, following love. me on Twitter. Yeah. Oh. Follows me on Twitter and now responds to my messages Beautiful. and stuff. So it's cool. But but uh, anyways, there's there's a segment in there that's called uh, follow your own obsession, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it comes down to, right? So you want to find the things that you're a natural at and combine your skills in a unique way, right? That's another thing coming straight from Naval Ravikant, probably the biggest things I've, I've learned from it is that talent stacking and following your own curiosity. So get into something that um, you're really excited about because it's going to show, right? Um, and, I, and, you know, I hope it shows in my blogs. Like, you know, I, I go into depth because I'm really excited about it, really interested in it and um, just get obsessed with that, with those topics and I just explore it. So follow your own obsession and then just think about the unique skill sets that you have and combine them in interesting ways, right? Like, I know for a fact that I'm not that good at video content creation, but I'm good at mm. presentation. I'm good at instruction. I'm good at teaching. I, I think I'm good at writing, um, but I'm not good at short form social media, right? Like I'm not, you know, I'm not good at that. Um, so identify what it is that you naturally are good at, that you're natural at, follow that, double down on those things that you're natural at, and then just chase those things that you're obsessed about and curious about. And I think that'll naturally lead you to find kind of your own your own voice and your own vibe, um, you know, would you down being authentic? Would you describe yourself as, as good at many different things or having the ability uh, to be good at many different things? I don't know. I don't know that I'm objectively good at anything. Um, okay. Well, um, well but, but I'll say this, I'm, I have the ability to be curious about many different things mm, um, mm. and I have the ability to, uh, try different things without judging myself um, at them. When I do try new things, yes, I do at times get upset with myself because maybe I'm not picking it up quickly or it's hard, but I'll still struggle through it. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I, I can't say objectively that I'm skilled in anything at all, but I, but I can say that I'm, I'm very curious about things mm -hmm. and I'm uh, comfortable um, just feeling stupid all the time <laughs> <laughs> i'm happy i'm happy you said that just because i feel like in the llm world and when you work with some of these top engineers you you really see the <laughs> the gap in the, let's let's claim it's stupidity it's not stupidity it's just it's just a knowledge gap in terms of exposure mm -hmm. and effort um because you see folks optimizing on these minute levels for instance like an inference llm inference is a whole exploding field and the sharpest mm -hmm. people that I know, <clears throat> excuse me, their, you know, their state of the art of what they know is constantly being challenged almost on a weekly basis. So it's nice that, you know, we can admit, okay, there's gaps in knowledge and that's okay. And, but we continue to move on. We continue to follow our curiosity to, to drive value in mm -hmm. the marketplace. A big mission of mine is to try to open doors for others, especially for folks in small regions like where I came from in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And I think for regions outside the US and Canada, where there's these established networks of companies that if you get into these network of companies, you're, you, the knowledge that you attain completely outsizes a lot of what other people might be exposed to. If you were trying to break into the data science field, um, how would you now approach it given that Gen AI is here? I think data science itself, that phrase um, or that, that role, that job title just doesn't really make sense anymore. Mm. Um, and I think, Ooh. I don't think we'll see more data science roles. Um, mm. I think it'll be rightfully called what it is. Um, you could be data analyst, you can be a, uh, you know, a, a product analyst, whatever, but, it's going to come, it has to be more nuanced, right? Because before it used to be, you, you know, you're really a data engineer or a BI engineer, but you're called a data scientist. Hmm. Um, so the, I guess the, the idealized, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, um, the mental model of a data scientist that people have, it's not accurate anymore because you have AI engineers, ML engineers, you have research scientists, research engineers, right? Before all these people used to be lumped as data scientists. Um, and then people would go into, you know, this interview, 
process or go try to break into this field of data science. And they're like, oh my God, I need to know all these different things. And they just become overwhelmed. Um, but really it's like, find the thing that you actually want to be, right? Um, or rather find the skills that you actually want to acquire and match that to the job that you actually want to do, right? For example, I don't like writing SQL. Uh, and I don't like, I don't like doing, um, creating dashboards and I don't really like doing product analytics. Um, therefore I'm not a good data scientist, but I've built my career about around being a data scientist. Mm -hmm. Uh, wouldn't really, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself a data scientist anymore. I'd much more consider myself an AI engineer these days because of the stuff I enjoy doing and the work that I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's more AI engineering than it is data science. Um, so yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but I think this, I, this job well, title of data scientist needs to kind of disappear, I think. Ooh, thanks. You, you're going to yeah. take away my job title, man. What, what are you <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I am in a line with that just because it almost seems what you do is completely company dependent, at least if you go into a company as, a, as an industry, data professional versus, let's say, in academia, I think that's, that's a little more uh, strict. And it, it depends on the amount of compute you have, the, if there's actually research scientists, the actual problem you're working on, the ability for you to deploy models or to deploy products or analytics. So there's so many factors that go into actually defining your role as a quote unquote data scientist or AI engineer, research scientist, all the fun stuff. So uh, yeah, I like, I like your thoughts there. Um, I wanted to shift into podcasting. Hmm. So you... You have the Artists of Data Science podcast. You've inter interviewed some great guests. And I've sort of, like I said, I've watched you for a while and I've seen kind of the evolution of it. It's interesting. If you go back and look at all your videos, you'll see when Comet was sort of around and now, you know, you've, <clears throat> excuse me, you've navigated and, and shifted over time. What encouraged you to start the Artists of Data Science podcast? And yeah, what, what made you decide yeah. to start it? Yeah, so I started Arts of Data Science early 2020, um, like oh, 20, before okay. the pandemic, before the pandemic kicked off. So like, it's not like it was like a pandemic project <laughs> because the ideation and, and first set of interviews happened before March of 2020. Mm -hmm. But um, I, you know, at the end of 2019, I started a lot of podcasts and watching a lot of podcasts, Impact Theory being one of them, like being the biggest influence mm -hmm. on me. Love that. Um, Impact Theory, James Altucher's podcast as well, Jordan Harbinger, um, Tim Ferriss, of course. Um, and I was like, dude, this is really cool. I bet I could do this as well. Let me try to do it. Um, and around the same time, I was thinking maybe I wanted to be one of those guys that start my own boot camp about how to get into data science. And this would be a great kind of marketing opportunity, whatever, to build my brand and, you know, get the word out there. So that was kind of like really the motive to start the artist data science. Um, but I didn't want it to be like a super technical podcast because I felt like there's already stuff out there. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I kind of wanted to be different. I wanted to be like a, uh, a podcast for data scientists, but not necessarily always about data science. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, you know, I had a bunch of guests on there, obviously data scientists, data science authors and things like that. Um, but then I also had, you know, other people you wouldn't expect to see on a data scientist podcast, like Akira the Don or like Robert Greene or James Altucher or, you know, Scott H. Young or, Annie Duke, even like all these people that agreed to be on my show, it's just it's wild to me that they actually said yes. And and did you just reach out cool by email? Yeah, yeah, to I did. Get that by yeah, it, oh, wow. it, it, it eventually became a challenge. Like, okay, how many New York Times bestselling authors mm. can I get to be on my podcast? <laughs> uh, and that was <laughs> that's really what started driving huh. me for a while, uh, and I ended up getting a lot of them. I'm excited by that statement because, and I think everyone who thinks about starting a podcast feels this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that I want, are you good enough Two, okay? There are other podcasts out there. Why are you going to replicate this thing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then three, how long can you sustain it? So as, as you began this journey, what were some of the doubts that came up in your mind? Man, it was just really time consuming, right? Because I was really hands on for the first hundred or so episodes with the podcast, Ooh. like editing and all that stuff. Um, 
I eventually had to hire somebody to, to help edit. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And you know, that, that was, that was good, good to do. Cause I, you know, I needed to outsource, get some help, but then also right around the same time, it's like, you know, my friend Kenji started a podcast. My other friend Dalian Lu started a podcast mm -hmm. and they're getting a lot more views and hits on their podcast. When we took, you know, compare numbers than, than I would, than I was. And I was like, mm -hmm. all right, well, what is it about my podcast is not good. People don't like it. You know, like, well, why aren't people listening to, to my podcast? Like as much as they're listening to Ken's or Daliana's podcast. Um, and so that, that also, you know, hits, I guess as a doubt, like, uh, people even actually care about what I have to say, you know, like, do they, I don't know, like maybe they don't. Um, that's always that doubt is do people actually care what I have to say? Or do people actually care about the podcast? And I mean, to this day, people, like I still get like thousands of downloads a month and I haven't released an episode mm. on the artist of data science in I don't know how long over a year. Um, yeah, well over a year, I haven't released, released an episode. People are still, thousands of people still listen every month. So I guess people do care what I have to say. Um, yeah, so, you know, the thing with artist of data science, it, it was a good podcast. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time doing it. Like I had these data science happy hours, which were just amazing. Like the, the amount of networking connections I made through there. Um, you know, a lot of the top voices on LinkedIn, a lot of, uh, you know, people who are now best-selling authors, Joe Reese, Finn Vashista, you know, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. like, you know, Jepson, the, the, uh, the, the data scientist formerly known as Ben Taylor, now known as Jepson Taylor, <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, you know, just all those people that I made, um, all those friends that I made through there has been incredible and, and amazing. And, um, a lot of people tell me that because they are, you know, because of that, those happy hours, like their career has changed and kickstarted in, in crazy ways. And you know, just that, you know, just the fact that people say that to me, that's, that's wild. Like, wow. Like you actually think that me putting on this space and having this space, like help ch change the tra trajectory of your career. Like that's wild to me. Um, so, you know, a lot of, I guess I got a lot of gratitude for everybody that spent time showing up you know, for the, for the happy hours. And, and, you know, that, that was so uncomfortable, bro. Like going live on LinkedIn and just streaming this live, um, with no agenda, no nothing, trying to direct the conversation, keep it going, avoid awkward silences, not dominate the mic, make sure that people have enough. Like I'm, I'm spreading the, I'm tossing light on everybody equally. Um, that was, it was challenging, but it, I think if, if one thing it made me really good at being a good moderator and a good panel kind of, uh, host. Um, downside of the arts of data science was because I was interviewing so many authors, all of my mornings were spent reading their books. So mm -hmm. I, you know, and all of my evenings were spent interviewing. Like I was like the, you know, you look at the number of episodes I have out, it's over 300. And I did that in just two years. So yeah, wow. I, I'd go on these crazy recording sprints. Um, and so that took away from my ability to upskill technically. Um, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. was, which I think set me back a little bit career wise. Um, but luckily like, you know, I've been able to, to pick up, but, um, but yeah, it was just that sacrifice. Right. Um, yeah, that that's an extremely important distinction that you make uh, funny enough. The, so I think by the end of this month, I would have three podcasts actually yeah. Yeah. running simultaneously. One is this one, right? Yeah. Portfolio podcast. And that's just me. One, networking in this space, and then two, I'm infinitely curious about all of the different AI startups that are out there, in addition to the actual professionals driving a lot of the research and production work. There's, there's a lot of focus on, oh, here's this new breakthrough research. Okay, that's great. Nobody's going to implement this thing in practice. So who are the folks that are actually building products? That gets me interested. Mm. The other one is Caribbean Tech Pioneers. That's where I interview people who are from the Caribbean, from my region, who are in tech. Uh, <clears throat> building these large global online brands. And, and the hypothesis there is um, to raise the level of representation of people from my region so that if you come from my region, you know, hey, I feel out there doing this thing. Hey, she out there doing this thing. And I've actually discovered we have quite, in the Caribbean network, there's quite a strong connection across many of these large, powerful companies, especially in machine learning as well. So that, that was an interesting thing. And then the last one that I'm launching is called Progress Guaranteed. So I think this is where you and I, I think, really intersect on the personal development. So I'm, I'm a complete, 
I am completely obsessed with personal development to a probably a dangerous degree. Um, and and if if you're saying something, I'm not hearing yeah. it back on my end. But let, let me run through this thing. And I've learned over time. So I, this picture I, you see behind me, it's called NFT Recap. And, and one of the questions I wanted to ask was about your failures. So for me, this was a a good failure and and knowing when to quit. So you know, when the NFT craze uh, sort of took off. I noticed that the people who were making the most amount of money were the ones who had the YouTube channels because they could um, essentially create the market, create the hype, and then you dump everything on everyone. So I tried to become a NFT YouTuber. That didn't work out very well because I just realized that um, uh, high schoolers had a much, much better bent for it than me and that I was actually sacrificing my technical skill by putting all this time in. So I cut that short, but it gave me all these skills about presenting on camera, setting up a YouTube channel, all of those things that I now um, give me the confidence to go start uh, some podcasts. How do you know when to quit a particular endeavor like this? Yeah, quitting artist of day science was tough. Um, it was a really tough decision because, you know, I'd created this space on Fridays for the happy hours that people had grown accustomed to showing up for. And I felt like I was mm-hmm. just taking that away from everybody. Like it wasn't just me that stopped doing it it was them that stopped having to stop coming like this it's impacted a lot more people than just me um so that was a tough decision but you know right around the same time like you know my my second kid was born um and so i needed more time more 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 energy to focus towards them um uh, yeah it just it was it was a tough decision but I, but i knew i had to quit i had to stop i had to stop it because um there's other things I need to focus on, right? Like yeah. I was being pulled in a different direction, I guess. And I felt that pull, mm-hmm. I felt that pull towards that other direction much stronger than I did to stay where I was at. Um, mm-hmm. So leaving the artist data science and, and stopping that podcast uh, was a tough decision, but like the pull towards what I'm doing now is much stronger. And the pull towards me now, like, uh, you know, you, you look at some of the stuff I do now with, you know, Desi ad live streams and, and all that other stuff. It's super technical. Like it's, it's really, really technical. Yes. So it's a completely different, I think, side of me um, that maybe people didn't know that I was like, I've had the capacity to be this actual, actually technical that I, you know, I'm, I'm not just a influencer or a think influencer. Like I'm hands on with this shit day in, day out every day. Like I'm mm-hmm. doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just felt that pull a lot stronger. Like just the, the, the pull to, to create more technical content and, it's nice. It's kind of blossomed now into some other, you know, stuff. Like I've got, you know, I did that course at LinkedIn Learning for computer vision. I'm working on a course for LinkedIn Learning right now on Lang Chain prompt engineering Ooh, with Lang Chain. Congrats! Yeah. Thank congrats. you. Yeah, my third rewrite because the API keeps changing. Um, <laughs> I've got another. Course. I saw your post about that. Yeah, That's it's awesome. just, it's a pain, man. Um, but I'm pegging the uh, the version now, so whoever's watching in the future, it'll work the same. Mm-hmm. Um, do another course for LinkedIn Learning, uh, Retrieval Augmented Generation with Llama Index. Fantastic. Two more courses with LinkedIn Learning, one on uh, text generation uh, using Hugging Face models because um, my, my focus with these, with these courses are for data scientists, right? Before it was personal development for data scientists. Now it's deep learning and generative AI for data scientists because just because you're in data science and you're a data scientist, like, I don't really think that means that you have skill or knowledge in gen AI or deep mm. learning because data science is really statistics with rebranded and I'm graduate degree in statistics. I've passed several actuarial exams. Like I was a statistician through and through, but I was not good at deep learning. I didn't know anything about generative AI until I had to start learning it. So that's who these courses are created for. Um, you know, I've got a book deal now with Wiley. I just signed the contract yesterday, practical Ooh. retrieval augmented generation. Yeah. Like I'm not an expert in retrieval augmented generation. I probably don't know anything about it right now at this point, but I will become an expert through doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's one thing. I just put myself through very, very public um, things at a very public level. uh, And that forces me to get good at it. Um, Cause yeah, I sat back and I was like, okay, I want to be recognized as as a world expert in generative AI with LLMs and, and, and retrieval augmented generation. How do I become that world expert? Well, I should probably do the things that an expert would do but I can't wait till I'm an expert to go do those things because that would take too long. So why not just do those things now and become an expert through the process along the way? Yeah. 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 That's kind of like the philosophy I had for that. Um, 
Dude, I don't even know what the original question was. I went so off the rails there, but <laughs> no, no, this yeah. is this is perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I realize is that I'm infinitely curious about people, and I'm infinitely curious about how people make progress. And one thing that I've learned is that, for instance, the you the the quote unquote tangent you think you just went off on, oftentimes there are these little anecdotes that if you go searching for it, it'll it'll be like a little piece of the puzzle that you were maybe missing in your own career that, you know, you plug it in and you get this acceleration. So for me, um, discovering these little things is what gets me an edge, mm. I think, over a lot of people and even just myself in, in, in my own journey of progress. So it, it's nice to hear that, okay, you don't quote unquote, imagine yourself as this world-renowned expert. That is a goal that you're trying to attain. And... If that, regardless of how you feel about yourself, you're going to put through the paces, put in the effort and sort of see what comes out at the end. So I, I really applaud you for uh, one, being very open and I think inviting for others to, to sort of share that same feeling that you may have, but they might not say publicly because mm-hmm. they may be afraid. So I, that's a beautiful thing that you're doing. And I've, I've watched a couple of your recent posts more in depth and it's nice to see that I could see maybe all of the vibe and personal flair that you've picked up over your time, you know, exposed and articulated well in the writing. It's not just a, hey, here's a bunch of Jupiter, excuse me, here's a bunch of text in a Jupiter notebook and it's this bland thing. There's an experience that I, th- I see you're trying to curate in your tutorials that um, I just want you to know that I, th- I think it's very useful and I think it, it's very uh, meaningful that you articulate it in your own voice versus just um, what you call it, random, excuse me, generic scientific prose. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> that. Say. Appreciate that. All right. Here's, here's an interesting question. Um, so I'm, like I said, my, my next podcast I'm launching is called Progress Guaranteed. And I'm very similar to yourself. I've, I think I have a, a name. I have over a thousand people that I want to target. I already have them like mapped out. Um, same thing for AI portfolio. I have like about 500 people that I'm going to target. So you giving, I'm, I'm taking this, this courage pill that you've given me to go reach out to people and, and see who I can bring on to the channel. And a big part of what I'm interested in is careers. So what is your, just like there is a, an objective function that we use in deep learning, machine learning to reduce our error for different models that we train. What is your career optimization function? Is it finance? Is it opportunity, satisfaction, wealth? Can you describe what guides your career? I think that's, uh, I'm still trying to find the right objective function uh, for sure. Hmm. Um, like, I don't know what the objective function is yet. Obviously, I want to get money, right? Like, that's, that's I need that, sure. right? To, to have it, mm-hmm. you know, to, to provide for my kids and, and my family, right? Like, that's, that's obviously one aspect of it, but that can't be the only thing. Um, cause I, that, you know, it wouldn't make sense cause there's a lot of things I could do for a lot of money that probably I wouldn't enjoy doing. Um, so mm-hmm. if I have a job, like I just want to opt- optimize for roles that allow me to explore my curiosity as much as possible. Um, and so that means that I need trust from the people that I am working for, right? Whether that's for myself, I would need to trust myself a lot. Uh, to do that, or I'm working for another organization as a DevRel, like I need them to trust that I'm going to be doing things that are not only in the best interest of, of myself, obviously I need, I need to do things in my best interest, but it's going to be the best interest for the, for, for the organization as well. So um, I want to maximize for trust from, you know, my, you know, the organization I'm working at, right? Like I can't work at some, some place that does not trust me, right? That just, that wouldn't make sense. So I need trust right at the gate, a ton of trust. And because with trust comes flexibility, um, you need the ability to explore my curiosity, um, even if it leads to a dead end, right? Um, so that means working somewhere where output is not really the key, where like the number of blog posts I put out in a quarter should not be an objective measure of the value that I bring to the organization, right? So, um, and that sounds weird, right? Like, out, like I need to be somewhere where, where out, output is not, doesn't uh, correlate with the value that, that I bring, right? Um, so yeah, I guess those would be the three, four things. Right? Obviously, money, trust, uh, flexibility to explore my own curiosity, 
And uh, I guess the fourth, fourth thing is just um, a place that doesn't correlate output with value. Did you rehearse this answer? No. Because <laughs> that was very well articulated, oh. I'll be honest with you. Um, I ask this question to a lot of people. And this has been one of the most, maybe it just aligns with maybe how I feel mm -hmm. as well, because I'm infinitely curious about many different things. And I was thinking the other day, like, okay, if I leave NVIDIA, go to a startup or go to another company and get more money, would I be as happy? Right? Even if I made, let's say, almost twice the amount of money I make now, would I really be happy? And one of the things that happened to me recently, um, I had a, a friend of mine, his sister, passed of a brain aneurysm. Mm -hmm. She was 26. And she was a social media influencer, had a whole life ahead of her. And it really, I had seen her the week before, and then boom, you get the news that this person is gone. And it really forced me, it, it put a, an, an extra, what you call a parameter in my objective function to optimize for probability of death, <laughs> essentially. So how am I, you know, if I, if I weight that parameter more, the, the probability that I am going to die young can be high because I have now gathered a new data point. She was healthy, et cetera, et cetera. So if I now induce that into my objective function, how does my outlook of career sort of change? And, and for me, this podcast, this time that we're spending, one thing that I learned is that every episode that I record, I'm recording someone's history. So possibly when you pass, there's lots of episodes that for your family to go dive through, but this is a one portion of your legacy, but one portion of the memory that you're leaving sort of on the planet. So for me, as a, as a podcaster, there's an underlying tone outside of the downloads. And, and I think I'm, I'm trying to stay focused on that first for a long time, hopefully. And, and I hope to maintain that, that purity of the art versus just Number of downloads, um, mentions by big guests, you know, naturally you want big guests because I think it, it gives you the confidence that you're on the right track, but I'm also trying to balance that with every guest that I bring on, um, has meaning every guest provides value in different ways. Yeah. So I appreciate you, um, yeah, sharing I, some of those things. It's beautiful. Like as a podcaster, I kind of definitely align with that. But one thing I've, I've noticed, I think the audience is going to listen to you regardless of who your guest is. Um. So mm. big guess, you know, might not be the most important thing um, because, you know, not all fans of that big guest are just going to listen to a podcast because that big guest was on the podcast. People are going to listen to your podcast okay. because it's your podcast and you're the one that put it together. So mm -hmm. much more, they might not even know the big guest. They might be big in your eyes, but to your audience are just another guest on your podcast. Um, so I think that's something to, to consider. No, oh, yeah, I appreciate you saying that because I think all the folks that I've, interviewed so far. I've either tracked them for a long time or they sort of came across my path. Um, and I, I do realize like other people don't hold these people in as, as high a regard, but I'm, I'm stoked either way. So yeah, it's a good, yeah. a good distinction that you call out. Uh, what's something you're obsessed with besides Gen AI? Uh, my kids, for sure. Mm. Um, definitely, definitely obsessed with, with my kids. They're to me the cutest, cutest kids. I got a three-year-old son and a oh, wow. uh, one-year-old daughter and they are oh my yeah, yeah. um like my three-year-old son dude he's like just the funniest kid dude he's so smart <laughs> he's so like like i've been around other three-year-olds like i'm the oldest cousin of out of you know 11 cousins uh and the age gap is huge between me and my my younger cousin so i've seen a lot of three-year-olds growing up this kid is something different um um you know, also obviously obsessed with him because um, we just found out he has ulcerative colitis, uh, pan colitis. And so for a three-year-old, that's mm. a really, really rough diagnosis. So, you, you know, you imagine as a parent, you're wiping your kid's bum when he's taking a dump and there's blood in the toilet every single time. Um, you know, he was in the hospital at the end of, of November. Crap. That, that, was, that was tough. So I'm obsessed with him uh, <laughs> because he's just this mm -hmm. really interesting character, but also like his health. Like I want him to have good health. and. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be, make sure that we can give him good health care. And then my daughter, obviously obsessed with her because she's just so damn cute. And she's, she's, she's such a character and has a bunch of personality. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, my, my, my kids, my family, I'd say. Beautiful. What's, when are you going to start teaching your kids AI? 
I, by me, I don't like the word AI, but let's just go with that word AI. Well, I bought, I bought, I bought a, a set of books. One of them was Neural Networks for, for, for Babies, Coding for Babies, oh, Bayesian that's... Probability for Babies. They have all these uh, four babies books. Um, so I've, I've been starting them. Um, interestingly enough, my kid was running around the other day saying, I'm a language model. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but, you know, like, so... I tend to wake up a little bit early and I'll, and I'm here in my office and I'll, I'll work in the morning times. And my son has that early riser gene as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I might be up at, at five thirty six down here, just kind of studying and working and he'll come down maybe about seven and I've got the laptop screen open and code is up and, you know, he'll just sit on my lap and I'm like, Hey, check this out. Let's go to Dolly three or let's go to SDXL. And you know, what do you want to see? Let me, and I'll type hmm. it up and it'll appear on the screen and he just be like dumbfounded. And then I try to kind wow. of try to explain to him like, oh, this is what, you know, this is what data does. Like this is, this is called, you know, this is called a language model. And I, I, I give it words and it gives me words back. Or I, you know, this is a uh, diffusion model. I give it words and give us pictures. Isn't this cool? Or like, look at all this. This is, this is code on the screen. This is, this is what I do. Um, hmm. Cause I think it's important for them to, uh, to, I don't know, see me working. And I think it's important. They know that I have this work ethic that I have. Um, yes, because it makes them. I think. I hope it makes them more curious. I try to get my kid into coding by buying um, a Nintendo Switch. I bought it too early. I bought it last year, and he wasn't really into games then. So I'm trying to get him into games, um, mm. because I feel like that's an avenue um, into tech. Like I don't want to force him into tech, but you know, open his his curiosity to it. Curiosity, yeah. And it seems like you're a big. Um, you index a lot on curiosity. That's yeah. what I'm learning. Yeah. In this conversation, what what can people do to increase their levels of curiosity to further their career? So I don't think there's a lot of things that. Um, okay, so how do I say this? Um, I'm I'm of the growth mindset, right? Like I, I do mm-hmm, believe that human mm-hmm. potential is unbounded, unlimited. People can can do anything, right? Um, uh, apart from physical stuff, right? Like, I, I mean, my kid's never going to grow up and be Michael Jordan. This is physically impossible, right? Like, there's physically impossible mm-hmm. stuff that we can't do. That's fine. But in- intellectually, pretty much nothing is impossible. Um, but I think we do become endowed with, like, certain personality traits at birth. And maybe mm-hmm. we're conditioned to have personality traits through um, the way we're brought up. Yes. Um, but I feel like there is, like, a natural level of curiosity that people will have as they grow up, right? Um, and that curiosity can be, the fire of curiosity can be, uh, f- you know, put out by parents who tell you to stop asking questions or that fire of curiosity mm. can be kind of, you know, my, my kid's always like, why this, why that, why this? And I'm like, I get to a point where I don't have answers and I'm, you know, kind of started making it up. But, um, uh, <laughs> but Curiosity is one of those things that I, I don't know if you can actually increase it in your adult life. Like, I, I don't know. Ooh. I don't know if that okay. can be increased. Um, Cause I've got a lot of older friends. Uh, you know, obviously mm-hmm. I've got friends my own age. <laughs> Surprise. Yes. <laughs> a couple, uh, as, as, as few as there are, I have friends my own age. Um, and these guys are just not curious and nothing I could do will make them curious. Um, mm. And um, I don't know. I, some people just like to take things for granted and, and not pursue it. Um, but I do think people can get interested in stuff. Like I think people can have, have interest in stuff and stuff. So I think there's a link between interest and curiosity, I guess. Um, so to increase your curiosity, maybe just to increase your level of interest in something. Um, and try to just try to just ask yourself maybe why, right? Some people might hear something like, mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Or just take it on face value and move on. Um, but they don't necessarily pursue it another level deeper and another level deeper, level deeper after that. That makes sense. One of the, so in, in, in your career exposition that you just shared, right, you had switched to a bunch of different roles, right? And, and I learning what your criteria for your career optimization function of flexibility, um, money, trust, how do you know when it's time for you to change to another job? And what's your style of saying goodbye to a company? 
Yeah. Um, the lack of trust, I think, is a big one. If I, if I feel like I've mm. consistently been putting in effort and like the results do speak for themselves, but I'm still not getting the trust I feel I deserve or the flexibility I feel I've earned, um, then mm-hmm. I know it's time to go. Like, Gotcha. Right. Um, and I think yeah, the, you kind of get rewarded for these things also monetarily, right? Like you should get a bump in salary mm-hmm. if, you've, mm-hmm. if you've demonstrated these things, right? Um, yeah. But if you're not getting a bump in salary, I think that's indicative that the company doesn't trust you or, or you know, that, that's what I think it, it's indicative of. So if you've been in a role, role for, for a couple of years and you haven't gotten a salary increase, I think that's indicative that they don't trust you. Um, mm. right? um, Good point. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, but then also like I'm the kind of guy that's always looking for my next job. Um, so I'm always looking for the better opportunity, right? Because if there's a better team out there that I should be working with or a better company I should be working with, I should go work for them. Um, yes. So I'm always like, always, always looking for new roles. Like, it doesn't matter. Like I interview pretty consistently and most interviews don't end up panning out just because I'm not interested mm-hmm. in, you know, I've had a conversation with maybe the founder or the the head of the department. I'm like, eh, whatever. It's not worth following up with you guys. I'm just leave it as not, not pursue it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, for me, that's, that's the big thing. Like if I feel like I'm not being trusted, um, then yeah, I think it's time to go. Yeah. I'm happy you say that. I, I don't often hear many folks say that they're interviewing a lot and it is good practice. And I know many executives that go do that consistently, you know, they'll talk to you like, Hey, I'm here forever. And that same time behind the scenes, they, you know, doing their own interviews and stuff like that you know, really locking into their career. So happy that you uh, point that out, that you should always be, what is it? Searching well, for your next There's always be closing yeah. and then ABI, always be interviewing. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, being in Devrel, like everything I do is super public, right? So I am mm-hmm. always incentivized mm-hmm. to do a really good job, no matter where I'm at, no matter what's yeah. happening beside, yeah. behind the scenes. My name is attached to everything I put out. Every article I write has my name on it. So I have incentive to always do a good job, no matter what the situation is. Um, I'm never disincentivized from doing a good job. So even if I could, even if I am interviewing. Yeah, that was the, one of the other things that attracted me to the DevRel role was that um, you actually interview, you, you've already interviewed almost mm-hmm. by the people observing the quality and the breadth of your work mm-hmm. over time. Mm-hmm. And, and that just serves as a, hey, when you come in, it's just a conversation at this time. <laughs> you want me to come work for you or not? Yep. So it's almost like a, an asset that you're creating every time. Yeah. That's actually, that brings me to another point. We're talking about career optimization. Like I do want to get to a point where I don't need to interview, where it's like, it's like I don't need to go through mm-hmm. a gauntlet where people mm-hmm. are like, we want you on our team. Here is a job for you. Do you want it? Done. Do you not want it? Right? Like that, I think yep. is the ultimate, like that, that, you know, is the ultimately what I would like. In my career, it's like, I don't even need to interview with anyone, right? Like mm-hmm. they're just going to be like, yeah, just come, come and join us. Right. Like my uncle, for example, um, he works at Google now. He didn't interview for Google. They just reach out to him be like, Hey, uh, you know, you're a chip designer. We're designing chips. Come work for us. He didn't go through an interview cool. process. He just had a couple of interviews with some really high level people and he was in not, not even a couple of interviews are just conversations. Conversations. Yeah. yeah. That's, you know, eventually mm-hmm. the point I want to get to as well. That's vibes, man. That's vibes. You'll. I give you by the end of the year for Gen AI, <laughs> you're done. Yeah. You're walking into to places. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so to round out, I, I have a couple of, I wouldn't say it's like a lightning round, but things that I find interesting. What books do you recommend folks read? What are your top three that come to your mind? Could be recent, could be longstanding. It could be more. Yeah. Um, definitely Mastery by Robert Greene. Like that's, that's mm-hmm. a good one. Um, really, really good book. Uh, probably the only one I'd recommend really. Um, and you could see like, I'm definitely, definitely a reader. Um, but mm-hmm. mastery is a good one. Uh, I think skin in the game, the scene Taleb, that's another good one as well. Ooh. Okay. Um, the, the inserto in general, like that series of books, I think is really good. Um, you know, I, that the entire, it, it, it occurred to me after reading the inserto that, the mm-hmm. entirety of Naval's How to Get Rich Without Getting Lucky is just a distillation of Nassim Taleb's work. Um, mm. It really is just the distillation of, of the inserto. Um, he passes it off like it's just his thoughts or his ideas, but it's really, 
you know, high, heavily influenced by that. Um, That's very interesting. But yeah, I'd probably read those two books. Um, or Anti-Fragile. Yeah, just Dean Sertel in general, I think is, is a good, good series. Yeah, I was reading Anti-Fragile right now. Yeah. Just because Naval was saying, you know, your, your salary is one of the most dangerous things that yeah. um, Heroin you could be exposed to. Heroin monthly salary, right? That's the two yeah. things mm-hmm. that... And it's true, man. Like it, it is really, really true. I mean, you know, like I mentioned, I got a, I got a kid that's got a condition. Like, I need the salary mm-hmm. coming in. I, the medication is not, ex, not cheap, right? Yes. Um, mm-hmm. No. Like his medication is not cheap. My medication is not cheap. Like it just adds mm-hmm. up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so yeah, it becomes a drug having that monthly salary. We will talk. Okay. What, what's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, a college student, and a professional in that order? High school, I would say just don't, don't worry about being cool. Just be yourself, right? Like don't get caught up in trying mm. to be cool, right? Just literally just forget popularity, forget trying to be cool and just do, do the things that you're interested in. Um, college student, um, I would say is uh, you, whatever degree you're studying for, chances are you're not going to have that job in that field. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe... <laughs> Maybe don't worry so much about the degree, uh, worry more about getting actual skills um, and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, get as many internships as possible because you don't want to leave college with just only a degree. Don't do what I did and just have just a degree. Like you need skills. So intern yes. as much as possible. Um, mm-hmm. And the last two were, which ones? Uh, you said a- uh, Professional. Professional. Um, professional, yeah. What we just talked about, always be interviewing, just always. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, always be searching for the right team that you're supposed to be a part of. Um, even if you're happy in your job now, like don't not do a good job in your current job, like obviously crush it in your current job, but in the background, always be looking for the next opportunity. Um, Mm -hmm. cause if there is a better team for you to be working on, you should be working for them or working with them. Um, another, there's another Navalism since we're on that topic, um, there's like the three legs of a stool he talks about, right? Uh, mm-hmm. the, so hard work is no substitute for who you work with and what you work on. And then there's hard work, yep. right? So find, mm-hmm. find the right thing to be working on, find the right team to be working on it with, and then work as hard as you can. Hmm. Beautifully put, beautifully put. Okay, so you're stuck on an island with a specialized chef who can cook anything. They can cook anything, but you only get two meals. What meals would you choose? Two meals for forever? Forever. Yes. From a specialized chef. So they make it exactly how you want. Yeah. Um, let's see. Before I do that, I would talk about the quality of the, 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 I want meals that have a lot of different ingredients. So maybe something that's like a salad type of meal. So there's always different flavors coming in. Right. Mm, so okay. a, a salad, a salad type of thing with some chicken. Um, that's, okay. yeah, that's, that's one type of meal I'd want. Mm-hmm. Um, and then pizza. Because again, <laughs> pizza, you can have, have a lot of different things on the pizza. So it's interesting that you say pizza. So, uh, Jacopo Taliabue, he was just like pizza. Yeah. <laughs> pizza was like his, his thing. So, it's cool to see yeah. what, what people align with. Um, so, my last question this is not necessarily like you being famous or anything, but what do you want people to remember about you? This could be even in your close circle people that you come in contact with, what, yeah, maybe what are you optimizing for on that longer term horizon? Um, just my persistence, I guess, relentlessness, mm. just like always just getting after it. Like I'm don't want to ever be known as somebody that was like complacent or skated by. I'm always yeah. grinding, always putting in the work, just doing what I need. Like definition of a hustler is you do what you need to do to get to where you need to be. So that's, mm. that's what I want people to, to remember. Appreciate it, man. I, I'm happy you brought up the hustler because internally I, I hustle all the time and hustling typically gets a very bad rep, but I think it's the true, um, one of the true energy drivers in, in progress. Yeah, absolutely. Well, appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on and, you know, we'll, I'll put everything in the show notes for folks to find you. But most importantly, I hope that people really pay attention to your quote unquote hustle and more importantly, your quote unquote persistence in the breadth of things that you do. And 
uh, wishing you well on your book as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to need it. <laughs> Appreciate <laughs> well, it. We have Gen AI, so I think I can help you out. <laughs> yeah. It's a very different bit. time. Yeah. Yeah. True. <laughs> cool. All right.